are listening to The Stick and Hack Show, a show about golf and life from a stick and a hack. Now, here is your host, Adam Grubb and Mike Ryan. All right, everybody, welcome in. It is The uh, Stick and Hack Show. I'm your host, Adam Grubb. That's Mike Ryan. Mike, how are you? It's a beautiful day in the neighborhood, man. What the heck? Just call is me that Mr. new? Just call me Mr. Rogers. Are you bringing that into the deal? <laughs> you probably workshopped that I a little did. bit. I did. I workshopped that one. <laughs> With who? No one. <laughs> On the car Myself? right here? <laughs> <laughs> Yuck. I don't like it. I don't like it. Uh, this is the Stick and Act Show, quite possibly the greatest show in the free world, from the greatest golf club in the world without the course. Guest today is Dr. Geo. <laughs> Go for it. All right. Do it. You ready? Yeah. Uh, Dr. Gio Valienta. No. No. Oh, damn it. Hold on. We'll, we'll go right to him. Gio, what, what, what's the deal? Say it for me. Valianti. Yeah. Exactly. See, there it is. Valianti. All right. We'll you see. Were, you, I thought you had it. I did too. We'll see you in eight minutes. All right. Um, <laughs> Dr. Gio is here, performance psychologist, and uh, he's using psychology to optimize the performance of the world's most elite individuals and organizations. Uh, and it's a fascinating topic, of course, but his pedigree of people he's talked to, worked with, is unbelievable. And uh, I'm, I'm super pumped to talk to him, not just about the, and we talked a lot in, in past about the mental side of the game, but it's a different, different style. And what he's bringing to not just uh, athletes, but also to organizations, leaders, and and those that that need that next level um, mental gr- uh, gear, i.e. Shane. <laughs> <laughs> he needs like a couple gears. <laughs> he's, he's in like couple- he's in like first gear. <laughs> Most oh, of the time. God, I'm sorry. All right, here we go. Uh, so I, I, we will start with the, uh, the story this morning. Uh, why the word that begins with why? Okay, so why the word that begins with why? Yep. Now, do you know the word that begins with why that nobody says, nobody can say, nobody wants to say besides Dr. Gio's last I name? I do. It's, sim- it's similar to uh, there's an S word that we right. don't say either right. uh, in golf. Yeah. Uh, yips, yips is the word I'm looking yeah. for. Now, as, I, as I'm getting ready to read this, I'm not positive that I haven't done this before on a show. I honestly can't. I, we'd have to go back, but I'm hoping that this is new information to everybody. Uh, I, I don't think we have. All right. I think, I, I think we've talked about the ifs before, but I can't believe, if, I don't know if we've talked about these two specific stories. I don't think we have. All right. So Kevin Na is a household name for most because no professional golfers had the case of the yips erupt so quickly as he did on such a large stage nine years ago. And this is still to this day what people think of when they say, don't Kevin Na it, Right. Uh, playing with the lead in the 2012 Players Championship at TPC Sawgrass, Na, with the golf world watching, developed a case of the full swing yips, and he couldn't pull the trigger. He literally could not start his swing. And and that's now become uh, fodder on the golf course. Say, hey, pull the trigger, Na, right? Right. He couldn't bring the club back, and he would just sit there for eternity, seemingly. Yeah, it was wild. I, rem- I remember that whole that whole thing, and it, it was it was. Not just that tournament. I mean, he was like that's where it couple, started. It, though. Yeah, yeah. But that, it, it literally started that weekend. Yeah, and where it was, it was just all of a sudden he couldn't he couldn't pull the. It club was unbelievable. Back. Just sit there. It was painful, right? To be honest, because I I just can't even imagine being over the golf ball and just being that like can't even. Make he was your, fearful. It was yeah. He, he cre- was fearful. Was, there was a, there was something yeah. that crept into his mind and yeah. and his body, and he physically couldn't right. pull the club back. Right. And, and the announcers, and I mean, that was when, um, oh, what's your boy's name um, on NBC? Uh, he just retired. Johnny uh, Miller. Yeah, thank, thank you. Damn. Johnny Miller was roasting him yeah. um, for two straight days. And he, but he couldn't pull the club back. Now, uh, the yips on the green can be debilitating, but they're not nearly as obvious and humiliating as the type of full swing yips that Na battled in that player's championship. And then for a couple years later, he didn't, he, he just kind of lost touch. And then somehow... And I would call it miraculously, but I'm sure there's a scientific reason for that. And uh, Dr. Gio will, will go through that with us here in a little bit. All of a sudden, Nah, just he he got it back. Um, another famous person and one of the greatest golf champions of all time also battled the yips. Tom Watson, who won eight major championships during his career, uh, not because of his putter, but largely in spite of it. One of the game's greatest champions went through battles with his putter that could have crippled an athlete of lesser mental toughness. Watson, whose putting woes cost him an opportunity to win the 2009 British Open at the age of 59, which was an incredible story anyway, but imagine had he won, is on record as saying the yips likely cost him at least one major victory a year over a decade of his more than four-decade-long career. 
yeah, he was notorious for that. Um, it, it it was one of those things where when whenever he could get his putting going in any tournament, he seemed to be right at the top yeah. and and had a, had a shot at winning. And you know, especially in that that British Open, that he by all accounts should have never even been in contention for no. based on age and right. just a million other factors. But um, that yeah, wasn't he, that that wasn't that that long ago. No. Um, no. But unlike other golfers, uh, including others that have had the, battled the yips, Watson didn't alter his grip or change putters or do anything different. He chose to deal with the issue for what it was, a mental challenge that simply required toughness and focus to get through. Given his status of one of the greatest to ever play, there is no doubt he managed to do just that many times. Yet one has to wonder just how many more wins he would have had if it not been for the yips at that at that part. Um, and, and there is a, a fear that comes that comes through uh, most athletes uh, at a time, and you can you can look at any professional athlete who's gone through a slump at a time. Major League Baseball players, I, I would say, probably are the top when it comes to having to fight through a mental toughness and 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 that grit to get through a batting slump. In golf, it's the same thing. You saw it from Jordan Spieth for years. They said that he just didn't have the mental toughness because he hit this peak so quickly in his career that all of a sudden he couldn't hit that uh, that you know, the top of the mantle every single weekend and it started to affect his, his entire game. Now he's, he's seemingly he's back on the way through back. that. Yeah. I think um, he's on the way back. He, we're going to see him break through, I think soon. Yeah. So um, that brings us up to our guest. Now, Dr. Geo is with us. He is a, a performance psychologist. Dr. Geo, welcome in to the stick and hack program. Thank you, gentlemen. It's nice to see you. Good to see you as well. Uh, let's go through this. You're regarded as one of the most successful performance coaches in the world. You graduated with a bachelor's and master's degree from the University of Florida and a PhD from Emory University, where you studied social cognitive theory under the world-renowned professor Frank Pajeris. Dr. Geo, you began applying SCT to golfers, and the results were immediate and compelling. Over 50 professional wins on the LPGA and PGA Tours. Simply by changing their psychology, you were able to help golfers change their scoreboard. In football, you worked with the Florida Gators under Urban Meyer's tenure and helped individual players aggregate their work into a national championship. You were invited by Coach Sean McDermott to be the head performance coach of the Buffalo Bills. As the Bills were mired in a 17-year playoff drought, the, the results, two playoff appearances in the first three years, thanks to your work and, of course, the players. But uh, that was <laughs> that, that, that's a, a just the quick resume of what you've done uh, over your career. Uh, your job reminds me of uh, Wendy Rhodes from uh, Billions on Showtime. Uh, she her job was to sit in in, the, in an office and and talk with these uh, with these traders for Axe Capital. This is a fake show. It's a real show, but it's a fake storyline. <laughs> <laughs> Axe Capital um, and making sure they were trading at their absolute peak performance. Is that truly what you do? And how close does that relate to your actual job? You know, it's uh, the, the truth. Uh, real life is sometimes stranger than fiction, uh, Adam, and, and it is what I do. Uh, I work with a lot of portfolio managers and, and I'll tell you a very recent story just in the last uh, six weeks. I had a, a portfolio manager who are the, the people who invest the money. Um, they're, they're the ones who pull the trigger and, and are sleeping on risk and they can make or lose sometimes $10 million in a day. And I had a portfolio manager call me, you know, six weeks ago, he was in a slump. He hadn't made money in two months and we retooled his brain. He made money the next seven days in a row. And now 20 out of the last 30 days, and it's all by tweaking his psychology. And the interesting thing about investing in the, in the capital markets is the psychology is very similar to the game of golf, which is why working with golfers and investors, a lot of times it's very similar conversations. The physical component is different, but in both games, uh, they really are mental games. And, and, and like the proof is in the pudding. Like, like I said, he hadn't made money in two months. He made money the, the, the next seven days in a row, and this is him telling me this, and then 20 out of the next 30. So it's a mental game, and that is what I do, believe it or not. <laughs> Dr. Geo, um, you work with, and you just talked about it, not just athletes but uh, high performers uh, in the business world as well. Are there any traits in high performance performers excuse me, that uh, trend toward being a negative and then can actually hinder them long term? And that's a really good question. So I'll start with the positive side of that equation first. You know, I, when you talk about high performers, you know, one of the things I often say is, is Steve Cohen has more and Steve Cohen is the billionaire who, who in fact uh, they profiled uh, for the TV show billions, but Steve is arguably the best trader 
in the last hundred years, one of the best investors in the last hundred years. He's, he's got one of the best art collections in the world. He sort of wins at everything he does. He's great at picking golfers. When he and I, you know, you know, pick who's going to win the Masters. Like, he's just an unbelievable trader. So he picks winners, and he's really amazing at it. And he's a savant. He's gifted and brilliant and hardworking and tenacious. But what I always say about Steve is Steve has more in common with Tiger Woods than Tiger Woods has in common with Sergio Garcia or that Tiger Woods has in common with Adam Scott. Because the only thing that Tiger Woods has in common with Sergio and, and Adam Scott is the game of golf. But what Tiger and Sergio, I'm sorry, what Tiger and Steve Cohen have in common is being the best in the world at something. And, and the psychological traits cluster more around being amazing than they do the domain that you're amazing in. Like being average at something is the same. It looks the same everywhere you go. Being an average podcaster or being an average trader or being an average writer, they're all the same. The work ethic is the same. It's all the same. But at the very tail end of the curve, there's a profile for the Kelly Slaters of the world, um, for the Yo-Yo Ma's of the world, for you know, anyone who's living in the tail end of the curve. And, and to your question, for people who live at the tail end of the curve, are there negatives where there tend to be? Because what happens is there's a blending of the vocation and the av- avocation. One of the things they say in psychology is you are not your work. You know, who you are and what you do are separate things. Um, and that is generally a healthy way to go through life, but try telling that to the best of the best. Try telling that to Kobe, you know, when Kobe was around, try telling that to Michael Jordan. It's the opposite. Like they are, you know, what they do, their identity and their, their craft and a fuse. They are one in the same. So the dangers are that when you lose the career, you lose your identity, you lose your sense of self. We see this with NFL quarterbacks all the time who retired Dan Marino famously, right? Retired. Uh, and went to an identity craze. Like yesterday, I was Dan Marino, you know, NFL quarterback. Who am I now? Right? You, you're Brett Favre. Like, who am I? So the danger for these super high achievers is they pour so much of themselves into the work that when the work goes away, they they lose who they are. That's uh, fascinating, uh, Doctor Geo. The book Fearless Golf, written by you, um, is a, a phenomenal book. It, but it really talks truly about that um, that fear factor, not the Joe Rogan disaster of the early 2000s, but the, uh, the fear factor that, that creeps into someone's head right before they're supposed to do something remarkable. Um, and in some cases, something they've done 10,000 times in their life, it hits them uh, quickly. Uh, have you studied the greats that have gone through these things and, and, and the problems that they had? And what did you find in your studies? Well, Adam, I, I hate to call you out here publicly, bud, but I, in rehearsal, you pronounced my name perfectly. And, you know, once once this thing went live, you, 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 you hacked it. You know, I, I've never heard of Gio Valianti. Yeah, neither have I. So that was neither have first, I. So. I think he owns an auto parts so, store in Sacramento. I think that you know, you re, In rehearsal, you were, you were pretty perfect. And right. I don't know if you're a gamer. I, I don't think you're a gamer. I I'm gotta not. tell you. I'm, I'm not. So just I, for the record, Mike, the Mike will be with you in a second. <laughs> For the record, you and, and Gary, you and Gary Player are the only two people to publicly make fun of me on this show, and this is probably now uh, Mike's favorite show right after Gary Player, I would assume. Correct? Yes, <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> and I can confirm he is not he is not a performer <laughs> under pressure. Not a gamer, because 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 Mike in rehearsal, I thought he was pretty perfect, and when the green light went on, I was yeah. like, what is he? Yeah. Is yeah. he having a stroke? I did. No, I did. Uh, I had a mini stroke. We've talked about it for three minutes. We get it, Dr. Geo. I screwed up. Okay? We get it. That's the best. That's the best. Does he need medical attention? <laughs> um, I'm sorry. What was the question? Yeah, exactly. Who yeah, cares? Back to what, what, Who cares? Where were we? Uh, the question was, have you studied the stories of the greats and the problems that they had, and what did you find? Yes. So uh, this is another good question here. So we, in psychology, let me see if I can say this the right way. When people think about success and failure, they they tend to think of it in binary terms that they're opposite things because the brain tends toward binaries, right? We like things to be convenient. And so things are true or they're false they're good or they're bad. um, And you fail or you succeed. And that's not, actually how success happens. One of the terms that we use in psychology, it's called normative failure, normative failure. And the idea of normative failure is that 
when failure becomes the norm, resilience becomes second nature, right? So, so, so failure is actually baked into success. It's built into it. And you can't have the success without the failure. And so one of the things that you often find out of, out of people who don't quite make it is they spend a lot of times trying to avoid failing. They try to avoid falling. They don't put themselves in situations to fail. They stay safe. And as a function of that, they create their own artificial ceiling, right? So you can only go so far. Whereas the best of the best, BOTB, right? BOTB, the best of the best. They, get, In fact, I'll tell you that when Rory McIlroy reached out to Jack Nicholas uh, many years ago, because Rory was just having trouble uh, finding you know, his ability to close in the big tournaments after his initial run. So after Rory's initial run, he went through a lull. He reached out to Jack. And Jack's advice to him was mistakes are okay. Literally, it's like, you know, you're, you're, you're trying so hard out there to not make mistakes. Now, why do golfers try to not make mistakes? Well, because they know that if they make mistakes, they beat themselves up and they feel bad. So essentially, we condition ourselves as golfers toward fear because we're, we're, we're conditioning our own fear because we don't want to live with the consequences of when we, we beat ourselves up for making mistakes. And so one of the things you come to find that the best are able to do is they push themselves to the point where they actually do make mistakes. They want failure. It's like in working out, right? You've got to push the muscle towards failure to grow it. But that's true actually in every domain. You have to get comfortable with putting yourself out there and failing and then learning the lesson from the failure without the corresponding emotional abuse. So I'll give an example. With a golfer one time, I said, oh, here's his golfer was a very good golfer on the PJ tour. Still is. I won't tell you his name. And, uh, but he had a habit of beating himself up and it was known on tour that he was really hard on himself. It was affecting his team. So I said to him, I said, I want you to make a list of all the bad things you've ever said to yourself on the golf course. You know, all the names you've called yourself and you know, things like, you know, you're worthless. You know, you don't deserve to be out here. You know, you, you suck, you stink, you know, you're all the things that golfers tell themselves. And as he was making his list, I said, Hey, by the way, let me, uh, let me see some pictures of the family. I haven't seen the kids in a while. And he hands me his phone while he's making his list and said, okay, are you done? And, and I said, okay, now, and I held up a picture of his children. I said, I want you to read that list to your children. I want you to tell your children that they're worthless. I want you to look at your children and tell them that they suck. I want you to, he said, well, I can't. I said, well, why not? He said, cause it would crush them, you know, and I can't even do it to a picture because the thought of saying this to my children is so horrible. I said, well, what makes you think you can say these things to yourself and there's not going to be an effect, right? That you can't talk yourself. PGA Tour is so competitive uh, that you can talk yourself off the tour tour like that if you don't have your attitude right. And so it's a lesson learned. So this golfer went the opposite way, started really engaging in some remarkably positive self-talk and um, and has been an ATM for the better part of the last decade. And I think largely it's because of the mindset shift. Wow, <laughs> that's uh, that's impressive. Doctor Geo is the guest here. Uh, he is a sports psychologist. <clears throat> you know, <clears throat> can you tell us why you think uh, the pandemic has had such a, a massive positive impact on golf? And you know, how vital has it been for us to use this sport as sort of a mental saving grace, just for the everyday golfer? Yeah, I got to tell you, it makes me so happy. Um, because like you guys, I love the game of golf. It's, it captured me when I was young. I've written two books about it. It's become my life's work and, and, and it's not because I need a job or it's not because it's, you know, it's a good living. It's, I literally am in love with the game because it's such a, a, a wonderful game and remarkable. It's complicated. It, it exposes us. It keeps us honest. It's social. It's, it's literally in my opinion, it's why I stay in golf. You know, I've, I've worked in every professional sport there is and academia. I've worked with writers. I've been a writer and I always come back to golf because it's an amazing game. And the, the upside for all of us who have been in the game a long time is watching new people enter the game and fall in love with it. And what's happened uh, disproportionately is a lot of wall street investors um, who have, are now down in Florida from Chicago or, or New York are taking up golf. So I have a lot of my investors who are falling in love with the game. And so it's really a lot of people that haven't been in the game. It's because the game opened up earlier. It's because it's easy to social distance. And again, as I always say, you just need to expose people to the game. You know, let the game do the rest of the work. Just put a golf club in their hands, let them start hitting. It's happening with my children right now. So yeah. And listen, it's a game uh, because it's social. It's 
it's a net positive toward mental health. You know that that when people are not social, their mental health degrades. Um, it's a social game. We know that motion creates emotion, so it's a game where you're moving. So it's literally it's a situation where you're outside moving and social. You know, somebody in the mental health professions, those are the big three things you're looking for. Get people moving, get them social, get them outside. So golf is a net uh, net benefactor from the pandemic, but I think the real winners are the, are the people who are being introduced to the, this awesome game. I'm going to abandon a question that I had. Um, I'm calling it a, 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 audible. an audible here. Okay. Okay. Um, so I've got uh, three kids, um, and they're all very different, uh, but two of them are, are athletes. The middle one's still trying to find her way, and she doesn't listen to the show, so it won't affect her. Um, <laughs> but – uh, my oldest and youngest both play volleyball and they couldn't be more different in how they approach their own game. It's a team sport, but it is a, a sport of individual mistakes. And uh, my oldest does what the pro golfer does and says, uh, no matter how good she played, that she sucked. No matter how, you know, she only remembers two or three of the of the shank hits and, and the bad passes or whatever. My youngest who is um, the exact opposite. As soon as it's done, it's literally done. And she, and she sets back up and she gets ready for, for the, next, the next one. Why is it two people that came from the same people um, and have been raised the same way and are playing the same sport at the same club and in almost the same age, near the same age brackets, so different in how they approach their individual and team sport? Yeah, that's, a, you know, it's interesting. They do studies on identical twins in, you know, I think Minnesota, right? The Minnesota twin study. The Minnesota twins, the baseball team, right? Because we, that's the, the, very clever. Right. That was I'm still, mad, I'm still mad at Dr. Geo from earlier. I'm still mad at him. <laughs> so I'm trying to let that kind of. This is, hey, <laughs> we hey need own it. it. Own it. We, it, it. It wasn't me who choked. Don't, don't <laughs> externalize this one. That was your. Hey, don't, bring, don't, don't bring your, on, your psychology to me. Okay? I want that's more. not what this is about. <laughs> I want more Adam analysis. You're, you're, stay away. <laughs> Keep that away. Um, yeah, so in, in scientific circles, they ask the question, if you have two genetically the same people, you know, where do the differences come from? Because uh, you have a genetic blueprint. Same. Sometimes, believe it or not, in utero, we talk about the environmental at, uh, impact. Like, so obviously, even though they're raised in the same household, they're having different experiences. You know, two people looking at the same TV show, you will remember different things from the same show. But that actually goes back to in utero to the sounds they hear, to the moments that they have. Some one is sleeping, one's awake. So even in, 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 in genetically identical blueprints, you have an expression in real life of different personality traits and different things. So it's not uncommon to have two kids in the same household being re- raised by the same parents, playing the same sport, the same club, to posture really differently uh, towards, uh, towards the sport. And the other thing is they're probably as siblings differentiating from each other, the process of individu- individuation. It, you know, when someone's creating their identity, it's the answer to the question, well, who am I? And for some people, uh, like Matt Kuchar, Matt Kuchar barely remembers half the shots he hits in a round of golf. Ask him after a round of golf, hey, hey Matt, what'd you hit on 14? Which one's 14? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's the par four. It's me. <laughs> which par four? It's like, which par four? Oh, that one? What did I hit? Like, he doesn't, now, that's not making fun of Matt. That's because Matt is so present in the moment. Like, he, he gets so immersed in the shot, the ancillary details don't matter. And it's really good that he has a short memory. Like, that's why he's been on tour for 20 years. Uh, then there's other people, Jack Nicholas, Tiger Woods, Nick Faldo, who can recall every shot from just about every tournament they ever hit. Um, and that's also, for the same reasons as that, they're present for every moment. When I talk about the best of the best, he talks about a unifying characteristic. They are present for every moment of their lives. That's the, when you spend time with these people. That's really what you walk away with. When you look in their, their eyes and you're with them, you realize they are there for every moment of what they are doing. And, and if you can coach someone to do that uh, and give the requisite skill and practice the right way, you have a better chance at, uh, uh, at, at creating champions. I always say uh, late in the year on the PGA Tour, second half of the season, you know, Freud said that the eyes are the window to the soul. The eyes are the window to the soul. And at the second half of the year on the PGA Tour, you see golfers walking around with dead eyes. They're just beat up. They're haggard. They're tired. The game has beat them up. They traveled. Um, the other players, just it's a, it's a tough dollar out there on the PGA Tour. Um, but that's when you can tell when people are being present or not. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the idea of the bounce back. You, you've talked about how Jack 
would wait a hole before his true bounce back would come. What did he do differently than most amateurs do after a blow up or a bad hole? Well, Nicholas has had great, you know, what's called proprio perception, which is great body awareness, but he also had great physiological awareness. So what he would do if Jack had a bad hole, what he would do is play the next hole as conservatively as possible. He said to give himself a window of time to let him, his, his, his physiology settle down. Now, most golfers aren't even self-aware enough to know the physiology of swing. And even if when they're aware of it, they're too stubborn or impatient to, to take a whole off. So the reaction of most golfers is, hey, I made a bogey. I got to birdie the next hole. So what they do, to make a bogey or a double or worse, and their physiology is spiked and their grip pressure is tight and the swing is short, and in that moment, they're going to try to take more risk and force a score. And great golf courses are designed to punish bad decision-making. So what most golfers do is they have a bad hole and they try to get, get that, that stroke back right away. They take more risk, they force it, and then it compounds an error. I always say in golf, it's okay to make mistakes. It's not okay to compound mistakes with bad decision-making. So what most golfers should do is the opposite of what they do do, which is after a bad hole, you should play the next hole as conservatively as, as possible and either make a par or if you get out of there with a stress-free bogey, that's better than the alternative where you keep the, 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 the limbic system spiking and your body creating all these stress hormones. Bring it down, you know, and, 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 and make up your strokes deeper in the round. That uh, reminds me of like uh, going on tilt um, in poker or when you're gambling or when, when something and you, and you lose a big hand that, that uh, your next reaction is I got, I got to get that back, you know? Um, mm -hmm. And, and instead of just sitting and, and letting the cards go around and just kind of waiting and, and stewing for a half second, but then forgetting it, that's the same thing. That's what's being on tilt is in, in poker and in gambling, the same in golf. And, and that's, we all do it. And it does, I mean, it is a very hard, I would think, to learn that skill and to, to be mentally aware and acute enough to understand what's happening to you um, because you're right. And, and those blow up holes. Now, a PGA uh, hitting a, a, a bogey frustrates them like a, an amateur hitting a, an eight, right? Um, that's where I think the, the, the blood pressure really, really hits. But for an amateur, Trying to get that back then over the course of the round is the is the next thing. Yeah, I think he he's Doctor G is absolutely right, and I can attest just from my own experience, like the times where I have a bad hole and then I'm trying to like make up for that. The next hole is when I have my worst holes, mm -hmm. right? I may have had mm -hmm. a, a dumb bogey or whatever, right? And then I'm like <laughs> bogey. <laughs> Give you a break. That's why I'm the stick, okay? <laughs> um, but. <laughs> And then I really try and push it the next hole and be like, all right, I'm, I'm going to try and make a, a birdie here or whatever. Yeah, exactly. exactly and it ends up being, it, it, it always goes the opposite direction. And I find the times where I'm in a better position is when I just let that go, just try and play a solid hole the next hole. And usually I'll either, I'll, I'll make a par or once in a while I'll come back and make a birdie, but it's not when I'm trying to make a birdie. If I, in my head, I tell myself I've got to come back and make a birdie. Yeah. That's it's it goes the opposite direction. I find. Um, I'm going to abandon my last question and ask you a new question. Um, <laughs> well, because he's saying so so whole, many, it's just whole things inaudible. He's saying so many incredible <laughs> things that I, I want no, to do this backup it's thing. Good. But um, when when things are going good or when things are going bad, how do you either a stay in that and do you? I mean, let me let me ask this a way that makes sense in English. I'm starting to sound like producer Shane here. Um, <laughs> when when you when things are going well, how do you stay in that moment? And when things are going bad, how do you get out of that as quickly as possible without pressing? So, you know, the, the, the cliche, modern cliche in golf, you want to call that is routine, routine, routine. Everyone talks about staying in the same routine. Um, but the reality is the game of golf, when we're playing good or bad, uh, any, any time, it doesn't attack your golf swing. It actually attacks your rhythm and your tempo. Uh, there, there are forces at work where uh, parts of the brain respond to what's happening with score or who's watching and so forth. And, and, and the sequence of event, events is we get quick, then we get tight. And what happens with the golf club is if you take your grip pressure, you know, where you normally set the club, and that grip pressure gets fractionally tighter, all of a sudden the club's going to set in a different place. And then as you come down into impact, you can't release the club properly. So what happens with golfers is is 
when they get out of sorts on the golf course, either either bogey or double or worse, or they're on you know making birdies or they're shooting the round of their life. Uh, what happens is they they start to speed things up. We get quick, and then we our tension levels, and then the golf swing falls apart, uh, which is why it's so hard to finish a round of golf, or it's so hard to get off the bogey train. So the routine that we build at Fearless Golf, uh, we call it twenty seconds of greatness. You know, it starts a certain way, it ends a certain way, it's bookended by two breaths, and that the best twenty we call it the best twenty seconds in golf. But built into that twenty seconds is we protect the golfer's tempo and tension levels. And then they commit and make a fearless swing at their target. They emotionally detach from the shot and then they close. And all of a sudden, so I, I still from Urban Meyer, the, the football coach, he calls it seven seconds of greatness. He coaches his players in, in, in football. You have to hold the block. For, if you can be great for seven seconds, you know, between seven, about 70 times a game, offensive, defensive plays, you have a chance for greatness. This guy's a multiple national championship winner. So we, we in Fearless Golf do the same thing with golfers. We protect the both from, from the bogey train or from choking because we have built a very specific 20 second routine that all of our golfers go through that keeps them consistent through the variability of the game. Dr. Gio Valianti, thank you so much, sir. It was an absolute pleasure to have you on. I, we could talk to you for another half hour, 45 minutes, obviously. Um, it, it, it is fascinating work that you're doing. Fearless Golf is the book, uh, and you have another book as well, right? Golf Flow, it's about when golfers get in the zone. Okay, so Golf Flow and uh, Fearless Golf, go check them out. Uh, Dr. Gio, we'll be with, back with you in just a second. We're going to play uh, in or out, okay? You bet. All right, hang, hang tight. All right, Mike, uh, the takeaway here. I don't know. What, we got 25 minutes to do a takeaway? Unbelievable <laughs> yeah, stuff there. All of that is fascinating to me from the, the mental standpoint. Um, just hearing how, you're, how you work on mentally training yourself to be great and to, and to be able to execute when you're under pressure. And that's one of the things that, that fascinates me. And I think is one of the keys to really taking your golf game to the next level is being able to train your mind and be able to be in the moment, um, and, and block out anything that's happened before or, or what you think needs to happen after and just staying in that moment. That's the biggest thing to me that I, I feel that anybody in golf it plays golf. If you can kind of train your mind for that, that's where you can see a huge, huge change in how you play the game. And it's not always just, I think people a lot of the time are so focused on the mechanics and the swing and all of that, that I just think being able to, to, to train your mind to stay in the moment is, is so huge. Uh, you and I have the same takeaway, uh, being present. Um, and, and this is an interesting takeaway because this is Dr. Chelsea Day's uh, one of her main things early on was being present in, in shot for shot. And you hear it all the time, just one shot at a time, right? Volleyball, it's one pass at a time. In basketball, it's one, it's one pass at a time or one shot at a time. But being present um, is, is something that he said. And then the, the other is uh, the um, mistakes, compounding your mistakes with bad decision-making. I thought that was, that's a fascinating sentence. And, uh, and that is for business, that's for golf, that's for uh, family, <laughs> your marriage. Right. I mean, anything you take that and, uh, and, and understand what that means and to make sure that you are not compounding your mistake with bad decision-making right afterwards. Uh, I think that's powerful. And then the, the seven seconds of greatness, um, there, there's so much to unpack there. So the, the takeaways uh, I think are endless, but uh, those are the two things that, that made the most sense to me, um, throughout that entire interview. Yeah. He's uh he's fascinating. I'd, I'd love to be able to just chat with him sometime. But I'm sure the uh, the check at the uh, bill I would receive would be uh, <laughs> above my pay grade. <laughs> Today it is. Today, <laughs> today it absolutely is. Um, all right, Doctor Geo, you're back. I'm back. All right, uh, let's play uh, in or out. All right, we're gonna play in or out. TV doctors. So this is of our foursome. Love it. Okay, of our foursome. There's yep. three of us. This yep. is the. Yep, you get it. Here yep. we go. Um, Doctor Gregory House. In. He's in for me, yeah. yeah. In. He's in for me. He's my sure. favorite yeah. of all time. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Miranda Bailey from Grey's Anatomy. Gio. Yeah. She's in? She's. Yeah. We go out. Yeah. Um, out. Okay. Uh, Dr. David Banner. Absolutely in. Dude, like. 
so in. Yeah. <laughs> Not I, only in, I would try to provide. I would try to. I would play mental games with him on the golf yes. course so he can finish up as the Hulk. Yes, exactly. That's exactly <laughs> like that's where I was. The biggest in in the world. Absolutely. Yeah. All right, he's in. Uh, Doctor John Watson. Uh, in I guess. Geo. Uh, Watson. Uh, Sherlock Holmes. Watson. Sherlock, Sherlock Holmes. Oh, I mean in. Yeah. No. Out. I love nerd. <laughs> I like nerdy. <laughs> Uh, Doctor Richard Kim. He would, he would have, go ahead. He, he would he would have paralysis through over analysis. He'd never he'd be he'd pull a Kevin Knott. He'd never pull the club back up for Watson. Uh, Doctor Richard Kimball. Uh, in absolutely in for me. <laughs> Do you know him? The f- I don't. The fugitive. The fugitive. Uh no, out. Yeah, out for me. <laughs> I can't. I can't bring that into my world. Oh, yeah, man. that's a lot. That's a lot to deal with on a round of golf. I just think yeah. about it. I mean, I, the heat, that too, dude too went through stress, a lot. Too stressful. Yeah, too stressful. Yeah. Out. I just want to talk about the one armed man the whole time. I know he would. <laughs> <laughs> he would. Uh, <laughs> Doctor John Becker. I don't know why he's on here. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so sorry. Becker. Becker. Uh, it's from uh, Ted the TV show. Yeah, Ted, Ted Danson. Danson from from Becker. Um, why is he in here? <laughs> I'm gonna go. Yeah, who cares? Go out, who cares? Out. I'm gonna go out. Geo, I'm out. On Dr. John Becker. What's I mean, it, it's hard to say no uh, to uh, uh, what was his name on Cheers? Ted Danson. Oh, but, yeah, yeah. Uh, Sam Malone. Sam Malone. Mm-hmm. Sam Malone. I mean, who doesn't want to play golf with Sam Malone? So right. I, I would play with him. Just so I want to ask, you know, what you know, what it was like to serve beers with Carla. All right. <laughs> Well, well, we're not playing golf with the actor. We're playing golf hey, with Dr. Okay, whatever. who cares? It's it Becker. <laughs> You're <laughs> overanalyzing, Adam. Too, too, uh, much, too right. much analysis. Dr. Gil Grissom from okay. CSI. So is this the guy with the sunglasses? No, that's uh, David uh, Spade. Not uh, David Spade. David uh, Spade. David Spade. <laughs> he's out. Uh, David Caruso. Okay. And he's out as well. Okay. No, I'm, this I'm is, out because I have no idea who this guy is. All right. So Gil Grissom from CSI. Oh, I don't need those eyes on my game. Okay. He's, <laughs> he's in for me. He was one of my favorites oh, uh, on that okay. show before it had 27 spinoffs. Uh, Dr. Fraser Crane. Absolutely in. Oh, absolutely in. There's yeah, your I cheers. Love, there's, love Fraser. Yeah, there's yeah. your cheers uh, reference yeah, yeah, there. Yeah, yeah. Fraser's in. Uh, Dr. Quinn Medicine Woman. <laughs> Dr. Quinn. Uh, I Medicine I, Woman. Sure, in. Yeah. yeah why, why not? not? Why not? I used to have a crush on her when I was a kid, so in. See, there it is. Look at that. Oh, yeah. Nice. That's nice. That's, my, that's one of my crushes. Okay. <laughs> well, we we'll uh, dissect that on the post show. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Uh, all right. Then the last one here, in or out, TV doctors, Dr. Doogie Hauser. Um, Doogie Hauser, the character, out. Uh, Neil Patrick Harris, in. Well, that's not the game, well, Mike. I don't care. I'm making up my own rules today. <laughs> per usual. Dr. Uh, Doogie Hauser. I'm, I'm I'm making up. I'm kicking out Doogie Hauser, and I'm going to put in Doctor J D uh, Don Dorian Scrub. Oh yeah, by Zach Braff. Oh, okay, yeah. I'm I can't that. believe is is not on your list. Yeah, see, but J D and Turk and Turk are, are both in. Okay, well, we'll uh, we so and Doctor Quinn, she's in. The people you just mentioned from Scrubs are in. <laughs> Uh, and uh, and house. Sorry, that's not a bad not a bad list. And um, the incredible Hulk. And the incredible Hulk. Obviously, Banner. obviously. Doctor Geo, uh, my thanks to you. Uh, go to fearlessgolf.com for more information uh, on his book. Uh, it was a pleasure, sir. Thank you very much for being on the Sticking Act program. Awesome. Anytime. Thank you. All right, we'll Thanks talk to you so soon. Much. All right, there he goes, everybody. Uh, Stick and Hack Show, quite possibly the greatest golf show in the free world from the greatest golf club in the world without the course. You guys enjoy your day. Thanks so much, Mike. Proud of you. Proud of you, man. All Peace right, out, guys. Later. Okay, we're done. This has been the Stick and Hack Show. Go to stickandhack.com to become a free member of the world's greatest golf club without the course. <laughs>